Hi, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to be able to share the result of this collaboration um, over the last year for the special collection in citizen science theory and practice on citizen science in higher education, on which Colleen Hitchcock and Maria uh, Aristido and I worked on together. So it was, it was a pleasure working with those ladies and um, we we're excited about the product that was produced. This special collection demonstrates the many different ways that citizen science can be used in higher education courses or in co-curricular activities in higher education, along with the benefits that students get from contributing useful scientific data uh, and broadening um, uh, their involvement in science. The diverse ways that citizen science is being incorporated into higher education highlights one of the many strengths of this approach, its flexibility and its adaptability. As events such as the global pandemic um, and extreme weather disrupt traditional learning environments, um, <clears throat> citizen science has provided a, a powerful alternative pathways to learning and engagement. And by embracing citizen science, institutions have also embraced technology to become more open and engaged with their surrounding or even distant communities. In some instances, meaningful collaborations have blossomed between students, instructors, scientists, and citizen scientists, <clears throat> along with in interested members of the public. Thus, the inclusion of citizen science in higher education represents a valuable way to increase student engagement with the world beyond the confines of a single semester. Today's format will begin with each author presenting a quick summary of their paper and then a discussion period um, afterwards uh, for, with the attendees. So I will begin. Um, I am Heather Vance Chowcraft, um, a faculty member at East Carolina University. And I have a paper with um, co-authors, including uh, Terry Gates, um, Kelly Hogan, Mara Evans, Ann Bunnell, and Alan Hurlbert. And our paper focuses on an effort to incorporate the Caterpillars Count Citizen Science Project into introductory biology courses at three different institutions. And the instructors at these three different institutions all um, implemented citizen, or, uh, Caterpillars Count in different ways. Um, but in all cases, students collected data, uh, used a standardized sampling uh, protocol, and, and could be uh, and contributed data to the um, database for, for uh, Caterpillar's count, and that data is available then for anyone to access. And then different um, courses did additional things as well. And what we found was that when we evaluated content um, knowledge and scientific literacy before and after their involvement in the citizen science, um, we saw gains in both content knowledge and certain um, biological literacy uh, scores using some original questions and some questions that were adapted from Gormley et al. 2012. We also analyzed reflection data from over 900 students to determine their perception of citizen science. And we found that students were able to identify benefits from involvement in citizen science that broke into a variety of categories, including benefits to themselves in their own learning, benefits uh, to the community, uh, benefits to science. And then they also uh, had to wrangle with certain ideas about data quality. So we concluded that the use of citizen science in these courses um, provided learning benefits to students and provided flexible options um, for instructors that were fairly easy to implement as a way to increase the um, involvement of, in research in these courses. And so even though the actual participation in citizen science was fairly modest in each of these courses, we could detect benefits um, and it, through these um, assessment tools. So I will pass along to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Dunbar Wallace, and I'm the project coordinator for the Boulder Apple Tree Project at the University of Colorado. I'm also a graduate student in the REACH lab, focusing on biology education research. 
specifically looking at the development of science civic engagement through participation in course-based undergraduate research experiences at community colleges. Um, our paper is entitled Creating Study Specific Tools to Increase Community and Student Engagement. And my co-authors are um, researchers from University of Colorado, including Deidre Yeager, Catherine Suding, um, Amelia Brackett Hogstad, Irfan Alam, and Lisa Corwin. Uh, we had colleagues from Front Range Community College, Paige Littman, Laura Baumgartner, Maggie Prater. Um, we have a science communication specialist, Dr. Kika Tuck, and we have um, another uh, citizen scientist, Adeline Chunemeyer of the Montezuma Orchard Restoration Project. And so the Boulder Apple Tree Project is a unique organization in that it brings together community members, students, and researchers with a shared goal of locating and identifying the oldest remaining apple trees from the orcharding era of the previous century. Students and researchers engage in research that reflects the concerns and interests of our community members. We're able to learn about these community interests through the annual Apple Blitz, which is a big data collection day, the Apple Symposium, Community History Days, and Grafting Days. As the program has grown, we've been able to expand our efforts to neighboring communities and community colleges. In our first year, students in an Apple genetics class collected tree data with information from local government sources. It became clear early on that we would need location information from community reporting to find the trees from the remnant orchards that have now become part of subdivided neighborhoods. The data from the first two years was utilized by a team of senior computer science students to create the interactive map of Apple locations and varieties. Members of the community are very interested in having a map to support fruit gleaning, cider making, and social harvests that provide fruit for local food banks. The first few years required hand entry of the data, which was very time intensive. In the following years, we utilized a freely available data collection app called EpiCollect, which was easy to set up for our collection needs. This app was great for working with students, but really challenging for our community members to easily access without being pre-registered by a member of our research team. And this really precluded folks from being able to collect instantly out in the field, or as it just came up. So to help solve this problem while still protecting our data, we worked with a new group of senior computer science students to develop the data collection app. Team Smart Apples, as they call themselves, has developed an app that allows users to download the app from Google Play and iTunes stores, register by using their email addresses, and then start collecting data. Users will take general morphological observations, general health assessments, and use the camera and GPS already built into their devices to provide images and locations. Within moments, the data will appear on the interactive map. So users will also have the ability to collect this data offline, which is useful in our mountainous locations, and then can upload the data when cell service is available. The Apple Data Collection app is in testing right now and will be used in our expanded network of community colleges and four-year colleges and by community members and researchers across Colorado. Users will have the opportunity to opt in their data to the National Fruit Registry of North America which was started by a broad group of citizen science apple exploring groups, such as the Montezuma Orchard Restoration Project, the Lost Apple Project, the Temperate Orchard Conservancy, and the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. So it's a, a really lovely um, synergy between students, community members, and researchers that we're really proud of. So I'm not sure who's our, our next speaker. Uh, Terry, do you wanna go next? Yeah, hey everybody. It says Terry Gates on there. I also go by Bucky Gates. I'm a teaching assistant professor at North Carolina State University. And the paper that me and Kristen Bedell published for the special uh, issue dealt around some work that was done in a classroom in which you had students who were uh, non science majors largely. Uh, and they participated in doing two different styles of online citizen science projects. The first was an ecological based project and the other was a molecular based project. And so the basis for the study was I'm trying to understand if having these students who are non science majors who have not gone through the process, courses of genetics, and chemistry largely, if they would find uh, online citizen science projects that deal with molecular stuff, things you typically cannot see out in the world. And if they viewed those projects in a different way compared to ecological projects, you know, you can go outside, you can see the seasons change, you can look at squirrels. And so <clears throat> what we did is we, um, we took survey data that the instructor had and we implemented some uh, mixed modeling approaches on this. In addition to just looking at the survey data, 
which included a wide range of qualitative information that we didn't get a chance to, uh, to code. Uh, we looked at overall impressions of the core, of the, um, of the projects, which are based on a Likert scale. And then we correlated those in the mixed modeling approach with different aspects of the majors for each of the students. We had uh, course performance, and we had a few other metrics that were included within that. And surprisingly, what we found is that there was no difference in whether or not the students wanted to, if they liked the project more, or if they even wanted to continue doing citizen science projects further in the future, based on whether or not they were looking only at molecular versus ecological. And so <clears throat> the reason that we really thought that the ecological projects would have come out on top and have been more preferred and possibly even have influenced the way that students want to do citizen science in the future is because when you go out and you look at a squirrel and you contribute data to that, then it might seem more like you're doing science. And then whenever you look at a lot of the molecular projects, things that revolve around maybe gene sequencing or creating family trees, those are based a large part on gam gamifying of the data. So one of the more popular ones is genes in space, which is, well, the project is now done, but it was a project that was used to sequence a cancer gene. And what the students would do is fly a spaceship around and trying to avoid asteroids. And so it doesn't seem like you're doing science. You're just playing a video game. And so because of that, we really thought that had an influence, but it didn't. And as we went through everything, there, there seemed to be very little correlation between the types of majors that the students had or the way that they performed in class. But the things that did seem to make a difference were how much time that the instructor put in to telling the student how the course related to the project, talking about the project, and then making the students feel like they were contributing to something. And so really, it's not about the project themselves being done in a class that really will make students want to do citizen science in the future or impact the way that students feel about citizen science generally. It's all about how they can relate to citizen science to themselves. And so spending that time, if you are an instructor, spending that time telling the students what the projects are about, telling them how it relates back to the course uh, subject, how it relates to the world around them, that's what's really important. Not the actual topic of the project, not the how much it relates to the class itself, but the time that is spent in class going over the project. That really seems a good thing. So it's all about more emotional connection than curricular connection. Great, thanks. Next up is Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie Lichty. I'm an education preceptor at the University of Delaware um, in the Interdisciplinary Science Learning Laboratories. And my co-authors are Pamela Mosley, which is another preceptor, and Chris, Kristen callis Duell, which is at the Danforth Science Plant Center. And our paper was looking at using Budburst to look at skills for data literacy and writing skills during a time of remote learning. And so here at you, um, here at University of Delaware, we have a course for intro for freshmen. That's a integrated biology chemistry course. And right as we went on to remote learning in March of 2020, we were trying, we were rocking right into ecology. And so we needed to have um, some type of project. We were really asked to have a project that they could still be hands on with. And so this is where we came up with using Budburst, the citizen science project for that. Um, for them to do that so that because they could then be in their backyards they didn't really have to go very far because at that time there was a lot of restrictions on travel and moving even in your own neighborhood and so what we did is we had our students use um, bud burst during that last four weeks of the course to collect tree data on their own trees um, think about how they can also use the data that's already on bud burst so thinking about um going through and collecting their own data. And so our paper really talks about the methods that we use to get the paper done. And then also to look at what, they wrote a paper at the end. So they had to write their findings and we went back and, re and scored them to kind of see 
and code them to kind of see what did the students do well, what were their struggles, and what did they learn, and could was um, and to kind of think about those kind of concepts. And so, the students had to then also compare their data to weather data, so long-term weather data that's out there to allow them to think about their connection to what caused possibly these changes in bud bursts or in the phenologies that they were looking at. What we found was that students were excited to go outside. So a lot of them said it was the only time they got to go outside during the early pandemic. A lot of them said they connected with their families because they had to ask questions about the trees in their backyard. And so they would have to talk with their parents. And then we also found out that they were still able to talk about the graphing and make their graphs. Um, they were able to think about limitations and data messiness, so how big data sets and how messy they can be and what they can do with those. And we also found that the one thing that was interesting that came out of it is that students didn't feel like they could trust the citizen science data. And I think that's something that is interesting and that I want to look into further because they, from the paper, it seemed that others have said the same thing, even other scientists. And so this idea of when to trust and when not to trust um, these data sets. And so that was our paper. Great, thank you. Brianna. All right, hi everyone. Um, it is five in the morning where I am in Australia. So I had to wake up at 4.30 and I'm still getting there this morning. Uh, but just a quick little introduction to myself. So I'm Brianna Johns, or Bree, as most people uh, refer to me. Uh, so I was a founding member of the Citizen Science Club at North Carolina State University. I was a past coordinator of the Citizen Science Campus at NC State, which is just shorter version for saying North Carolina State University. Uh, and I now work with the Gathering for Open Science Hardware as their community coordinator. coordinator. Uh, so I did this research when I was an undergraduate student at NC State with the help of Dana Thomas, Dr. Karen Cooper, Dr. Lisa Lundgren, and also Dr. Lincoln Larson. Uh, so I wanted to start out just kind of quickly explaining the unique context for, for doing this research. The, the title of the paper as well is, um, uh, it's called Undergraduate Student Experiences with Citizen Science Highlights potential, uh, the Potential to Broaden Scientific Engagement. And at NC State in particular, this was a case study because it was one of the first universities to have a citizen science club. So it was an entirely student run club. Students were doing citizen science projects and it very much shaped kind of the questions that we were asking in this paper. And one of the biggest takeaways from this club is not only were we doing projects together, but we emphasized that science is for everyone. That was kind of like our catchphrase. We kind of emphasized ways that students can have better access and it can be more equitable to participate in science. And for the club, one of the avenues that we saw was citizen science. Um, so just quickly, thank you for, for listening to that. Um, that's kind of the context that shaped it. And so in the instance for, for this paper, for this case study, we kind of looked at how participation in clubs and learning communities have already been known to increase the persistence of students who are underrepresented or marginalized in STEM. Um, so we kind of wanted to combine that with the fact that there is little information on how existing undergraduate students interact with and perceive citizen science. So we wanted to kind of ask, okay, where is participation occurring at NC State? What do students think of it and how does it affect their, their interest and their sense of belonging in science? Uh, so we went ahead and did a mixed methods uh, kind of, we did mixed method research. So we surveyed 143 students and then followed up with six interviews with students. And of course the surveys informed the interviews that we had. And we found through the surveys and the interviews that some of the, the biggest takeaways is that participation in citizen science was occurring both within the traditional classroom and outside of the classroom. So whether that's their extra, extracurricular activities or students just doing it on their own. Um, citizen science was something that students with an existing interest in science. So if a student already was interested in science, they were more likely to participate in citizen science and have that connection to it. Um, and one of the main takeaways is that we actually found a significant relationship between students who participated in citizen science and had them reporting a higher sense of belonging in science. Uh, in addition to this, we also kind of found that there were some challenges and misconceptions related to student participation in citizen science. Some students were unclear of how to 
how to conceptualize and define citizen science, even when given a definition. And a lot of students also noted that there was a lack of opportunities to participate in citizen science at the university level. Um, but we did also see that students noted in the qualitative interviews that citizen science can increase belonging in STEM because of its participatory nature and ability to counteract stereotypes of who a scientist is. Um, but again, of course, some limitations to doing this at NC State is, however, it was conducted at a predominantly white institution. And of course, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx students are part of the group that we're interested in speaking with, so that's important to note. Um, there was a low survey response rate, uh, so we ended up having to use a convenient sampling rather than a completely random sampling. Um, and also some additional investigations of student perspectives regarding citizen science are needed to better examine the broader engagement of students in citizen science and whether this helps with marginalized and underrepresented students in STEM. Um, so one potential avenue that could be taken in the future is, is measuring student interest and belonging in science before and after participating in citizen science and seeing if that changes because the snapshot that we got was just, yeah, it was just one snapshot in time of students saying that they report, reported a stronger sense of belonging. So it'd be interested to see if that changes before or after students participate. So again, NC State was, uh, it was a great place to kind of ask these questions with the existing citizen science club and all the initiatives that they were doing. You know, it kind of set us up for having this case study and it's something that I think would be great to, to be expanded on and, and take a deeper look. But thank you. Thanks. Haley. Oh, did we lose Haley again? Oh, no, she's here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I did drop off again, and so it wouldn't let me unmute temporarily. Sorry, I've been having technology issues, everyone. Um, Hopefully it <laughs> sticks through while I'm speaking, but um, yeah, so my name is Haley Smith. I'm a PhD student at NC State University, so bringing yet another study out of NC State to you all today. Um, I am speaking to you about our case study leveraging citizen science in a college classroom to build interest and efficacy for science and the environment. Um, and of course, my dog is getting talkative now. Um, <laughs> uh, my co-authors are Bradley Alf, who is another PhD student here at NC State with me, uh, Dr. Lincoln Larson, Sarah Futch, uh, Dr. Lisa Lundgren, Dr. Mm -hmm. Laura Basifke, and uh, Dr. Karen Cooper. And we did our study, um, Bri Brianna kind of gave you the context there for some of the programming at NC State around citizen science. So um, in particular, uh, she talked a little bit about the citizen science um, club, but there's also the citizen science campus program, which has kind of been an avenue for um, basically encouraging uh, instructors to incorporate citizen science into learning experiences and, and kind of a way to also uh, kind of test out new projects and, you know, t t test drive, things like that. Um, and so one course that they've done that in, in the past is the one that we looked at here, and it's um, like an introductory uh, general education, natural resources, conservation of natural resources course. Um, so usually about two to 300 students enrolled in this course across all types of majors, some in natural resources and sciences, some um, just taking it as a general elective. Um, and most semesters, there is a unit on citizen science as, you know, one of many methods for addressing issues in the natural resources realm. And um, it can be, it's taught by different instructors in different years, so it can be addressed different ways. Um, but we specifically looked at spring 2019 and fall 2020, uh, where we had two years that students did participate in citizen science. And in spring 2019, all, all the students participated in a specific iNaturalist project. Uh, looking at, or well, collecting arthropod data. So it was contributing to a, a subset of iNaturalist, a project called Never Home Alone. So specifically looking at the wildlife of homes, um, which generally means arthropods or bugs. <laughs> um, and so they were all encouraged to do that. And then were at encouraged, but not required to participate in both a pre and post survey about their experiences. And then also we used the device uh, scales to look at interest in, sorry, interest in science, interest in the environment, and then um, science learning efficacy and environmental efficacy. 
Um, and then also on the post survey had a chance to kind of reflect a bit uh, through open ended questions on, on their experiences. And then in fall 2020, uh, more so in an attempt to kind of avoid this issue that a lot of instructors feel they encounter with groups or with projects like iNaturalist to, to not data dump too much data that's not going to end up being curated. Um, students were actually given a, an option of several different projects. One was to do um, to actually analyze data from iNaturalist looking at bumblebee abundance and diversity. Um, they had the chance to use other sort of citizen science tools that were not necessarily contributing to a project, but using the SEEK app created by iNaturalist to go out and identify invasive species in their area. Um, and then the other was to read a book, so not a citizen science project. And so uh, particularly in that year, one of our interests going in was to look at, you know, differences maybe in the outcomes of students doing citizen science versus not, you know, who are reading the book or um, doing citizen science in different ways or engaging with different tools. Um, as happened with Brie and some other groups here, um, our response rate was a bit lower than anticipated, particularly that fall due to the pandemic, probably. Um, students were you know, taking the course virtually and weren't taking the survey in class. Um, so we're again encouraged, but not required to do so for the class. Um, so given our uh, lower response rate, we ended up just kind of trying to look for overall trends between the two years and then um, kind of dissecting things a bit further through kind of a not a true mixed methods approach, but a sequ sequential explanatory design. So we first looked at their responses to interest in efficacy and science of the environment versus their majors um, and which year they took the course. And then kind of, again, like I said, we saw these trends where particularly um, majors obviously probably unsurprisingly tend to start off with higher uh, sense of efficacy and interest already than non-majors so it kind of gives non-majors more room to grow um, but we did see that consistently across both years non-majors tended to improve more in all of those areas than majors um, but again we have this question of kind of like a ceiling effect perhaps with the majors where they're already starting off extremely high um, and then we saw quite a bit more improvement in the year where students were given a choice um, in which assignment they were to do, going to do. And then looking at the qualitative um, or the open-ended responses and doing a bit of qualitative analysis on that, we saw a lot of students um, express maybe an aversion to the topic of the project with the bugs. Um, so again, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, you know, students are like, oh, I learned a lot, but I didn't really like looking for bugs in my home. Um, you know, things like that. Um, and then a lot of students from 2020 you know, express just excitement and interest in the project or topic that, of the project that they did choose. And so really a lot of what we got out of this is that um, clearly from the improvement for non-major citizen science can be a really great gateway to bridging uh, interest into science and environmental topics in college classes, but also there seems to be a benefit to allowing students some degree of choice in what kind of project or, or activity they're going to be participating in um, to get some of that, you know, intrinsic motivation or internal motivation and, and buy-in. And so I think I've probably talked enough, but um, yeah, feel free to ask more questions later. Great, thank you. And our last author who is able to be here today is um, actually the lead on the special collection. Um, I'd like to introduce Colleen Hitchcock. Afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Heather. Uh, and just full disclosure, I had a little tech issue to start. And so Heather was able to step in and carry this all to fruition. So a big thank you on that front as well. But I'm Colleen Hitchcock. I'm a faculty member at Brandeis University. Um, <clears throat> and my contribution to the special collection was with two colleagues, John Sullivan, who is at Lincoln University in New Zealand, and um, Kelly O'Donnell, who is with uh, City University of New York, the Macaulay Honors College. And the three of us together thought it would be a fun idea to share our experiences using a particular tool. So we all use iNaturalist with our students. And so our paper was titled Cultivating Bioliteracy, Biodiscovery, Data Literacy, and Ecological Monitoring in Undergraduate Courses with iNaturalist. Um, I just have to confess that throughout this process, it felt a little bit like we were writing a love letter to iNaturalist. Um, so if that comes through for sure. Um, but if you haven't used iNaturalist, we highly encourage you to use iNaturalist. And there's lots of reasons why, but one of the main reasons was due to the platform's flexibility. And so in the paper, we share our experiences in different types of courses. So we all work with undergraduate students. Um, I use iNaturalist in two courses, 
one is a large format course with 100 plus students throughout as a kind of semester companion. One is a summer online um, course with usually has about five students in it, so two extremes. Um, <clears throat> John Sullivan at Lincoln uses iNaturalist in some upper level ecology courses, um, and he uses it in a very different way than I use it. Um, he uses it to do uh, simple ecological monitoring through use of additional fields in iNaturalist. And then Kelly O'Donnell, um, she, she might be the most ambitious of us, um, and so she <laughs> uses it. Um, there's a first year program that all students in the Honors College have to take across the many campuses in the CUNY system. I know we have some international people on here, but the CUNY system is huge. Um, and so it brings together 34 instructors and they do a one day bio blitz somewhere in the city of New York with about 500 students and they use iNaturalist. So really different models of using iNaturalist. Um, the key takeaways were that we love iNaturalist for its flexibility, but um, that flexibility allows us to meet our learning goals and work well with our students. And so we wanted to kind of think about the signature that it had both in terms of the data and then the signature um, that iNaturalist has in terms of what does it what, what do students take away from it? And so together we looked at um, observations made by about 2,600 students in our time using iNaturalist. And so we, oh, the other thing I should just say is we've all been using iNaturalist for several years with students. And so I think collectively we came up with 25 years of experience using iNaturalist with students. So early adopters, repeat offenders in using iNaturalist with students. Um, and some of the things that we took away from it was that students stay on iNaturalist. And so we can see, we can look at their signature on the platform after they're done with our courses um, and that they stay on and they stay on in positive ways. Um, and then we were curious as to, you know, how their data, um, right? So that, you know, if they're being introduced to this tool, how does their data fit into the context of other local data? And so we actually looked at their data or their observations within a 50 by 50 kilometer square area around where we were observing with our students. And they made all sorts of bio discoveries. And by bio discoveries, I mean, um, we're one of the first or the only um, uh, observations of a particular taxa or species. And so that was really exciting for students when they could kind of see that type of bio discovery and as a strong kind of, I would say a strong motivator of keeping them um, engaged on the platform. Um, we've had one of our students go on to become a curator on the platform, and so if you've used iNaturalist, you know that's quite a feat to kind of get to that curator level for sure, so they're definitely taking their science to the next level. Um, and then the other uh, thing is that we, uh, John in particular with his ecological monitoring, shows how um, iNaturalist provides a place to do simple monitoring with students in a way that um, he had kind of taken traditional activities that he had done as labs with his students, um, where they had used sped spreadsheets with the rules that they could, where the, how they had to collect data and add data. And iNaturalist actually prevented them from breaking the rules um, as compared to when they used spreadsheets. And students always kind of broke the rules when they were using spreadsheets, but doing it on this open science platform um, kept the students from breaking the rules. And so together we advocate for using iNaturalist, one, because students will keep using it, um, and two, because it you know, opens up kind of biomonitoring across the board writ large. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions about using iNaturalist and I'll kind of end there for the moment. Do you want to open it up to questions? Sure. I was going to say, do we want to mention, um, did you in your intro mention the other papers or should I do that here? I did not. I'm sorry. Yes, if you want to do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. So you've heard from some of the authors um, here directly in the special collection. We had a number of authors who weren't able to be with us here today. And so I'll just give a little shout out to what their works look at. So to entice you, hopefully, to go check out the special collection. Um, the other co-editor on the special collection, Maria um, Aristu, and her colleagues, they discuss perceptions of professional educators enrolled in a postgraduate course. So we do uh, look not just at undergraduate, but also at graduate work. 
Stevenson et al., um, they also use iNaturalist and they found useful biodiversity data was obtained by novice users using iNaturalist during college orientation retreats. So a co-curricular application of the tool as well. Um, Paradise and Barkovitz integrate citizen science with online biological collections monitoring to promote biodiversity literacy in an entomology course. Um, and so they use a different tool, they use bug guide, but they also use iNaturalist. Um, and then finally, Golumbic and Motion provide one of the few examples using citizen science in an undergraduate chemistry lab. So if you have some chem colleagues or you yourself are a chem um, aficionado, this is a great paper to check out. Um, and with that, we can totally now open it up to questions. Um, you can use the raise your hand function to kind of move to the top of the list, or if you're more comfortable putting something in the chat for uh, either Heather or I to read out Loud, we can do things that way as well. People can also unmute themselves if we want to have a more informal conversation. That capability um, is now available, I believe, to everybody. Awesome. All right, Julie has her hands up. We'll start with Julie. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, thanks everyone for sharing your stories and talking about sea science on your campuses and the various studies. Um, I think my question is for Deborah. I, someone had mentioned um, the lack of confidence that students had in C science data. And I'm really curious about what you thought was the root of that as someone who coordinates the C science program at an institution. Um, I find that there's a lot of faculty sway around perceptions of our, our data, even though we have a federally approved quality assurance pro project plan. So anyway, um, not to insert a little external processing, but that is, I'm curious as to what, why the doubt in the data? Yeah, so um, talking with the students, we didn't have them fill out a new paper, but having them kind of talk through it, they, they said, well, they're citizens, they're not scientists, they're not like us. Um, that was one of the big things I kept hearing from them, um, which is interesting because they were freshmen second semester, so that they already kind of had that mode of like, if they're not in our course, then they may not have the same um, ideas of what it is. Um, besides that, I think they just, they, I don't know if it's a, a thought process. I've been trying to think through this. And one of the things that has come up is the idea that we always gave them data that always worked and everything was perfect. And, and so that they weren't as sure what to do when something wasn't what they thought was gonna happen. And so the first thing they do is just say, well, it must be the data itself. And the people didn't know what they were doing. Um, Cause they do it to each other as well. So it's not just um, citizen science data. Um, when they have to use each other's data. So I think that's where we were coming from. Um, again, I I haven't been able to look into it further, but I would love to like kind of work with the students and, and interview them and kind of figure out what caused this um, thought process, because I think it's a, an important way for us to kind of work with them um, in the course to think about data assurance um, and quality control and that it is happening out there and then kind of how that, you know, how they can think through that as well. I'll add to that, um, if that's okay, Julie. So <clears throat> one of the things that I found in my own courses, so every course that I teach at the university engages students in some type of citizen science. Um, it varies depending on the course. And one of the things that I have done um, is I've replaced some of the primary lit that we read in our courses to be primary literature that uses citizen science and open science data to kind of start to sway those inherent biases that the students might have. Um, because I think once they see it's publishable and once they know the limits of what the data is and asking appropriate questions. So when students are using iNaturalist, if they're using it in my course, you know, I make clear what the application of species occurrence data is. And whereas John, the co-author, he uses data in a very different way and can actually say different things with his data because of how students are using that platform. So I think that's part of the key is kind of just starting to like train that next generation of students um, who don't think of citizen science data as other, but just think of it as data because that's all it really is. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate uh, those comments. And um, we have found as our students, one process samples for quality control for our volunteers and also play a role in training volunteers to collect data 
that that also helps with that transference because they can see the careful measures that are brought into place to help um, make sure that the data collected are of known quality. So thank you, thank you so much. Awesome. Vincent, go ahead, you wanna interject or add a new question? Vincent, you're muted. Can you unmute? No, you can't unmute. I don't know, Rihanna, are you still here? Can we unmute you? Hang on, I might be able to unmute Yeah, you. Vincent, you should be, should be good to oh, speak go. now. Here, let me unmute. Try now, say something. Try again. You look like you're unmuted. No. Vincent, do you, do you wanna type in the chat? We can read it aloud for you. Sorry, you might be on your phone, that might be tricky. But you should be able to unmute now. I think he is unmuted if his microphone works. <laughs> that might be he might be trying to uh, type in the in the chat. Can we I was gonna say while we're waiting for Vincent to maybe see if he can add to the chat, does somebody else want to? either add a comment about citizen science data or have a new question. I, I just put something in the chat about it. Um, one thing is that students don't always trust their peers. And so they're like, oh, you know, if that person's entering data in this database, I don't trust the entire database. Um, sometimes rightly or wrongly, they don't understand that there are certain quality control checks in citizen science apps or, or databases. Um, and so I think being explicit about that can help. And I think also what plays into that is sometimes people overestimate like the quality of, of data collected by scientists, which sounds odd, but you know, like students are sometimes shocked to hear that there could be um, messiness in a published paper, for example, or that people can't replicate the data in a published paper, or that somebody might make a mistake in a, in a paper. Um, and so I think that that can play into uh, perceiving these massive differences in data that would be you know, contributed by a true scientist versus a citizen scientist. And um, so sometimes I think it just shows a, a misunderstanding or misperception of science itself. I'll share a story from um, a course I'm teaching this semester. So I teach a course on citizen science um, that's just solely dedicated to the study of citizen science. And throughout the semester, we have practitioners come in and, and other campus faculty, et cetera. And many of our students on campus um, that are in the course are biology students in our program is mainly a cell molec program here at the university. But many of our case studies as citizen science reflects are often kind of ecology or environmental monitoring type projects. And we were probably three quarters of the way through the semester and we looked at a molecular based project and students who had been very accepting of citizen science data up until that point all of a sudden had significant issues with data quality that took me totally by surprise um, because of how receptive they had been to the whole process prior to that. And I was like, wow, we're not really having like those data quality conversations that we tend to have in this class. And it was just mind boggling to me or eye opening, I guess, that all of a sudden when we hit their field that the biases all came flooding back in. So um, I just share that as kind of a story, but it happens. But Colleen, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering, um, so with what we do in our class, we have a, a cure based class and we have opportunities for students to do um, our, our bio blitzes with the community. And it's interesting, we haven't um, actually measured differences in what they think about um, citizen collected data before and after, but they do see improvements in their perceptions of working with the community after doing the bio blitz. I know that when people are using larger scale um, sites like iNaturalist, it's hard for them to get to work with members of the community, but I'm wondering if having a service learning component where students are working with others um, and seeing how citizens collect data instead of guessing how, how citizens might collect data, that might show some improvements in perceptions of the data. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Hello, can you hear me now? We can, Vincent, welcome. You have to go onto my tab because somehow my phone was not allowing me to get in there. Um, I put a, a question in the chat basically, uh, how do we move this all this data collection towards actions? 
how can we uh, get it to the places where the results can be felt and touched? I think that's the next, because we've been getting data forever, but and moving the pendulum is moving to the results. How do we get that done? That's the, the, the key question, I yield. Thank you, Vincent. I think that's that's great. Um, I, I can take a little bit of a stab at that, again, from my citizen science course, not from this paper, but if somebody else wants to contribute something, happy to hear other voices first. Well, I could uh, re respond yeah. by saying- I, think, I didn't uh, see you, John, welcome. <laughs> You're incognito by a number, sorry. <laughs> Vincent, I, I share your frustration about uh, the difficulty in moving from observation to action, especially when dealing with undergraduate students and their, their relatively short uh, time of exposure, uh, especially at a community college. We only have kids for a couple of years. And to give you a, an example of a frustration, uh, we did uh, assessments of uh, road stream crossings uh, in a local watershed uh, and students did most of the work actually after, after being trained. And then three or four years later, uh, after the federal wheels of grant funding turn, you know, with their majestic pace, we got, a, based on the data that the students had collected, we got a few million dollars to do improvements to some of these road stream crossings. And this is long after the students have gone, of course, and they're on to grad, graduate school, some of them by now. And it's, uh, it's really frustrating, you know, that they, they did this great thing and it had a great result, but, uh, you know, they moved on quickly to uh, other parts of their career. Thanks, Thomas, and I apologize. I called you John, and I'm still having today's a day of glitches for me. So <laughs> my apologies there. Um, <clears throat> I will say I'll echo that sentiment of kind of working with local community groups is really a great way to get undergraduates and shifting from that kind of just data collection process to um, action. And that's something we've had success with here at Brandeis um, in the citizen science course. We didn't do it this year because of COVID, but typically within that course, um, I partner students with a local organization where they're doing some sort of citizen science activity in service of that organization. And it will vary depending on the nonprofit, what that um, action might be. But we have, for example, a local watershed organization that has done uh, urban heat mapping. And they worked with um, community members over the summer to do urban heat mapping and, um, a student actually, this one actually did happen this morning, this semester, a student is uh, taking that data and converting it into um, GIS maps for the nonprofit so that they can use that um, in their kind of next round of mapping and, and looking at some of the outcomes. And so I, those community engagement opportunities, if you're able to make them at your institution, or if um, you know people in those community groups are great ways to get students to kind of think holistically about data and putting data into action. That's been my success, at least with that. Hey, Connie, I, I like that you're saying using that GIS mapping. Um, that's something that, that we need to actually tap uh, tap on um, because right now the EP, uh, our federal government has done all these mappings. Uh, we have to look at census track. Right now we got American Recovery Act where there's all kinds of funds available to help communities if, but the, if we could dissect the information in this information to get it to community, that's why I think we could become more, is how we can become a service to communities on getting the resources they need to fix their own problems. And we could get, you know, the colleges and the university academia to work in this kind of facts. So I think we might be able to get more traction into getting positive work that's done. So, well, I mean, now I appreciate the data, but the data without work is just data. Very true. Um, we do have some comments in the in the chat as well <clears throat> um, related to uh, potential programs to look at. And then Julie added um, having students, uh, engage students in teaching community members how to interpret data and transition from, from knowledge to application as another tool. 
Thank you for that. Go ahead, Brianna. Um, I really like this question a lot and kind of similar to what Vincent and John and, and Colleen were saying, especially around uh, discussions with data collection. I, I want to quickly share one of um, my favorite quotes that was said during interviews with students. And um, one student brought up the fact, I mean, I kind of wish maybe there was a little bit more citizen science because I feel like we do a lot of closed off assignments or projects that are in the class, but they don't go any further than the assignments due date. So I think um, when like one thing that's interesting about the citizen science club at NC State is I think um, just in this kind of smaller sense, you are giving students a sense of agency over how much they're participating in the scientific method and the scientific research process. So I think for a lot of for a lot of undergraduate students, if there are ways to go beyond just data collection and feel as if they are actively being scientists and actively changing the world by by asking questions and you know researching the methods and just myself as an undergraduate student having the opportunity to do undergraduate research on this like changed a lot of things for me. So I think having things in place as extracurriculars that can allow students to just do science and citizen science, not just in the classroom and they have a more personal investment in it could change a lot of the ways that students are, are interacting with this. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I have to say there. Thank you. Thanks, Brianna, that's a great point. Um, I'll even say within assignments, when you're one of the things that I've seen students um, really give positive feedback on is, you know, at first uh, they're nervous, but when you give students the opportunity to engage in open practices, um, <clears throat> that once they kind of get over that initial fear of doing everything out in the open, doing everything out in the open, often also when they understand it and you really make it click for them um, also inspires them um, to kind of limit bad behavior. Sometimes people ask me like, well, how do you keep people from cheating on iNaturalist? You know, you can just upload photos from anywhere. And um, there's all sorts of mechanisms for kind of cheating within that kind of system. But when the students really understand that it's an open practice and that they're doing something in service of others and that there's applications to their data, um, they rise to that bar and kind of communicating that and repeatedly communicating that to them, I think is kind of key to part of that process as well. Can I add to that a little bit, please? Okay, oh, sure, Bucky. I, I've had to deal with this a lot. Uh, what I, whenever I teach my course, it's uh, 200 students plus every semester, and I send them outside. And what I do is I just say, look, this is about you, it's about truth, it's about trust, and the fact that if you lie on this stuff, you're gonna be messing up someone else's career. And whenever you put, give them that responsibility, a lot of them just do what they need to do, they monitor each other. And if you just give them the option, you can, if you're not gonna put in correct data, just don't put anything and just don't do it. They, a lot of times will just say, all right, you know what, that's fine. You gave me the choice not to do it, but I'm gonna do it because everyone else is doing it. And then it starts to be them just keeping track of each other. I guess for me, I, I also see some more abstract um, benefits here. Like, I think it, this sort of involvement kind of opens their perspective about who can be involved in science and what the function of science is in a way that has all sorts of ramifications and, and potential outcomes down the line that may not be direct, um, directly visible to how that impacts the community, but I think it does. Um, I think if, if people can kind of see that there are ways to use scientific knowledge to benefit communities beyond um, what they have historically thought of that, that opens their views and opens career pathways um, to students. So for example, you know, we at my institution have a lot of first generation students and a lot of them come in and if they have an aptitude and a, you know, for science and they like science, they think that if they want to benefit the community, they need to become a physician. And, you know, that's fine, that's great, that's a great pathway, but that's not the only way that science can be used to benefit the community, right? And so I think the more that they see alternatives, um, the better off it is. And I think it also helps um, counteract some of this defeatism that can come in. So for example, with large scale problems, they're like, but 
what can I do about this? What can a single person? And it kind of shows another example of how, you know, single people can act together in concert to um, address larger, larger sorts of issues. Um, and I think that's, that's very, very beneficial um, in general. And I think really this collection of big data is, that's almost like the challenge of our time right now, at least in biology, you know, there's huge amounts of data out there and, you know, genomics and ecological monitoring, all sorts of things. And so the question is, how can we make use of these data efficiently in the way that, that promotes the most good? Um, and so that is something I think as instructors, we all have to struggle with now um, is, you know, how do we teach our students to, to access and, and use those data um, for the greater good? And the question from the elephant in the room, when the data is gathered, how is it monetized, how is it utilized, and what benefits do it, it has for the community that you got the data from is a very important uh, crest that we got to definitely, is a bridge got to be crossed there so some things can be given back to where it comes from because the need is there and we should monetize and not fix the need. Excellent point. Thanks, Vincent. I see we just have, but this is an hour, right? I'm pretty confident this was an hour. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we just have about two minutes. I was like, before I end us and you're like, no, we had another 45 minutes. Um, so I see we have just about two or three minutes left. Are there any final thoughts or questions from the audience? Heather, would you like to take us out then? Sure. Um, so we just want to um, encourage people to to check out the special collection. The link is in the chat. I believe Brianna put it in. Um, and you know, feel free, please uh, share, tweet, uh, whatever you do to um, pass this to your network. That would be fantastic. We want to really thank the authors for their time invested in, in writing the articles, working with us through the editorial process, and then um, those of you who could be here today. And thank all of the attendees today. Um, I want to remind everybody that the contact information for at least one author from each paper is in the papers. So if you want to follow up on anything specific about any article, feel free to do that. I'm sure everybody would be happy to, to speak with you. And I also want to put in a plug for the Citizen Science Association's ed Education Working Group. Um, the working group is, um, you know, a, a set of CSA members who have an interest in education, whether that be in higher ed, K-12, or informal, we're split almost equally a third in each of those. And I'm one of the co-chairs for that working group. Um, so we've been doing a, a variety of things throughout uh, the year from reading uh, a report from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine about citizen science and learning um, to trying to create some resources for instructors um, and K-12 teachers to use when implementing citizen science. So we'd love to have you involved in that. You can access that through CSA Connect if you go to groups. Um, you have to indicate that you want to join, but we're, ha we, we're happy to have anybody who wants to, wants to join us. Um, and so please just join the conversation on CSA Connect about these issues. But thank you guys so much and- um, happy, happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, Vincent. I also see that Stacey is on the call and I just wanna give a shout out to Stacey for being our editor extraordinaire and helping Heather, uh, Maria and myself through this process and Rihanna as well from CSA for um, getting everything out for us. So thank you all. Yeah, and thanks to all the authors who are on today and everyone who contributed to this special issue. Um, we are always accepting con contributions to the Citizen Science Theory and Practice journal, um, even from whether you're a part of an academic institution or not, um, it's a great place to share your work um, and there are details on how to submit an article on that website. So if you go to the special collection link, there's more details about the journal there. Um, and then one other opportunity we just announced um, is our 2022 conference is going to be a hybrid regional and online conference happening in May. Um, and they're Recently, we shared um, some information about how you can help inform speakers. So if there's topics you're interested about or people you really want to hear from, um, there are details on our website, and I'll share a link for that um, before we close. But thanks, everyone. I um, appreciate your time. <laughs>